the massive price increases that utility companies have been warning us about, they're here. And on today's program, we're gonna help you do something about it. Hey, in case you don't know us, I'm Hope. And I'm Larry. And this is Under the Median, where every week we talk about practical frugality. We have heard from so many of you in the past few months saying that you had also heard from your utility company that your energy rates were going to double, particularly the electric rates. And we have as well. Now, we all know there are a number of factors in play. There are a number of reasons that this all is happening. But the bottom line of what we all wanna know is how are we supposed to cope with this? Although in this video, we'll be focusing on ways to lower summer electric usage, you'll find that many of the tips can be used anytime throughout the year. The bottom line is, the more of these strategies that you use, the better chance that you have of lowering your utility bills. We're going to give you a lot of tips in a short period of time, so let's get right to it. Tip number one is to make sure that you are using the appropriate lighting for the task. You know, we often have more lights on in a room than we need. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we'll use an overhead lamp that maybe has four or five bulbs in it. We would recommend turning those off and just turning on one side lamp for you to have on, especially if you're just watching TV or maybe right behind you while you're reading. Another thing you wanna do with your lights, make sure that you're using all LEDs. Mm -hmm. They use substantially less than the old tungsten bulbs. And another thing you can do is get USB powered bulbs. This is a bulb that I ordered off of Amazon. It's just a five watt bulb and we'll run these in the evening while we're watching TV. And this just runs off of a, I put it on a 10,000 uh, milliamp power bank and it'll run us all evening. A very nice background light to have. And then these I can charge, solar charge those up and then they're really not costing us anything to use those lights. And if you feel that you really have to use an overhead light, then go ahead and unscrew the unneeded light bulbs. Maybe one or two light bulbs in that light fixture would work just fine for most of the tasks that you use it for. If you need additional lighting, it's really easy just to reach up and screw in some more light bulbs. All the resources that we show you on this video, there will be links for them in the description of the video. Now, sometimes you actually don't even need to use electric lights. Right. And that is our tip number two. Tip number two, use natural lighting when you can. Go ahead and rearrange that furniture and place it so that the natural light coming in windows is going to hit that piece of furniture. So when you're sitting in it, you'll be able to make use of the light that's already coming in the window and you won't even have to turn on the overhead light. Strategy number three is make use of natural airflow. You know, in some parts of the country, mm -hmm. the the actual humidity goes down at night. Now that's not the case here in the Midwest, it actually goes up. But if you're in an area where it cools off quite a bit and the humidity goes mm -hmm. down, go ahead and open up your house and shut that air conditioning off, let that natural cool air come in. And if you need a little extra help in getting that cool air to move through your house, old fashioned tip, we used it in the 1970s guys, which was to put a box fan in a window. And if you want to go a step further, put in a window fan. You know, we had window fans in our old house and they worked really good. They seal up a little better on the window than a box fan does. So I would highly recommend a good window fan that will exhaust mm -hmm. air. When you use a window fan, by the way, it seems like you want to pull that cool air in. What you really want to do is turn that fan around and use the fan to exhaust the hot air from the house open a window on the opposite side of the house, and then that is what creates that airflow where you're actually exhausting the hot air and pulling in the cooler air on the other side of the house. Speaking of fans, that is strategy number four, which is to make use of fans. But before we get into the do's and don'ts of using physical fans, we want to say that we are fans <laughs> of the sponsor for this video, Creekmer Wealth Advisors. John and the rest of the team at Creekmore Wealth Advisors have been our personal financial planners for a number of years. John asks a lot of questions and he does it so that he can understand what your goals are. Larry and I have taken to calling it John's professional perspective with a personal touch. 
We just met with John four or five weeks ago, and he mm-hmm. took two hours of his time to help us walk through what it will look like and feel like when Larry retires at the end of this year. And he asked a lot of questions that we honestly, we didn't even know the questions that we should be asking. And he gave us lots of information and things that we needed to be thinking about now. What I found helpful is that John will take you through all of the options available Mm -hmm. and he'll help you select what best suits your particular needs. Now, if you live in the United States, John would love to help you out with financial planning or investments or retirement advice. And you'll find a link to Creekmoor Wealth Advisors in the description of this video. Now back to tips on actual physical fans. What's the cost to actually use a fan as compared to central air? Fans cost between one and two cents per hour to use. That AC, somewhere between six and 88 cents per hour. Now I know that that's a huge range, but it really depends on the type of air conditioner. Are you using a window unit? Are you using central air? The size of the room, the age of your house, the insulation in your house, uh, the square footage of your house. It's just a number of different Mm -hmm. factors. So that's a huge range. But what it does tell us is that it is substantially less expensive to use a fan than to turn on the AC. But one of the questions that we find is really interesting is, can you use them together? Now, this is something you may not have thought of. Fans work on evaporation, so they cool your skin and you need to be sitting in the same room with them. But if you will use fans in the room that you're sitting in, statistically, you can raise the thermostat on your central air by up to four degrees with no loss of comfort. Yeah, because you have moving air. Now the fan behind us, I just checked it using my kilowatt meter and we'll talk about that a little bit more in this video later on. On low speed, it uses 22 watts, and that really isn't very no. much. On high speed, 42 watts, and that is so much less mm-hmm. than what air conditioning uses. So certainly, using a fan is a good thing. Now, if you want to use even less power, we recommend these battery-operated USB mm-hmm. chargeable fans. And these, these run on very little power, They can even be charged using solar power. We can get into that more later as well. Another fan that I have, and and now this is just one we bought at Menards. We actually had an opening of this on one uh, one of our videos. This is a comfort zone. This is a really fun fan. It actually puts out a little bit more air than the comfort zone, and it has a built in three settings on the light. Uh, And it's also a USB rechargeable fan. So this has built-in lithium-ion batteries in it. So uh, excellent thing to use. Uses very little power. Something that some homes come with are whole house fans. Our home has a whole house fan. It's a large fan that is in the ceiling in a central hallway generally. They are designed to pull a lot, and I do mean a lot of air through your house. Statistically, about once an hour, they will exchange all of the air in your home. They work really, really well, but one caution when working with fans of any kind is you need to make certain that when you're using that whole house fan, you have a lot of windows open. For one thing, if you don't have enough windows open, you could burn up the motor. And secondly, if you don't have enough windows open, you could create a backdraft, which actually pulls some of the gases from your hot water heater up into your home and it can build up carbon monoxide. We know Mm -hmm. because we've done it it. once. Yeah, we've done it. Yeah, because that fan will be pulling that air backwards from the exhaust pipe from your hot water heater. You do not want to do that. The next thing you can do is make sure all of the leaks are sealed in your house. Now you can use caulk, kind of caulk around the windows, make sure your windows are shut tight and sealed. I always make sure ours are locked. If they're locked, Mm -hmm. they are in place. They won't lock unless they're shut all the way. If you're finding this video helpful, hit the like button. That will help us get this information out to even more people. And if you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button and the bell notification button. I've written a free ebook on energy savings throughout your home. There are 20 tips, it's a checklist, and you'll find a link to request that free ebook in the description of this video. 
during the daytime, you want to make sure that you draw the drapes. This mm -hmm. is to keep sunlight from coming into your house. Well, why do you want to do that? Well, sunlight brings in heat along with it. So you don't want the heat to come in. So draw those drapes to keep your house a few degrees cooler. Lined drapes are super helpful, but you know what's even better than that? Black out drapes. We've had a lot of viewers contact us and say, I bought some blackout drapes. They were not terribly expensive and there was an immediate difference in the coolness of the room. So look for either lined or blackout drapes. Another tip is to use smart power strips. Now we all know about power strips. A power strip is just an item that has maybe five or six outlets in it and one master switch, but they've made a new kind of power strip that helps you control the outlets that you have other things running power, possibly phantom power. So how does it work? Well, you'll have uh, two outlets, let's say on this one, that are always on. You have a master outlet, mm -hmm. and then you have some outlets that are controlled mm -hmm. by the master outlet. Mm -hmm. When the master outlet senses power, then it allows power for these. So if you have a computer and you have speakers and you have monitors on it and a printer and some other things, when you shut the computer off, it will automatically shut any item off that's plugged in to these other outlets. If you have some things like maybe some lights in the room that you don't want your computer coming on and off with, then you can plug those into the always on. And this way you're helping to control the power consumption in your home. Another note on things like smart power strips is to see if there's a place on your utility company website where they actually subsidize these products. It will be a place online that you can order through their website and get a discount on these products. I actually bought this from Dollar Tree, $1.25. But the only reason that it was $1.25 is because right in the box it said that this product was made possible through our local utility company. So it was a subsidized uh, type thing, and that's why I was able to get it for less money. Program your thermostat. And make sure it's a smart thermostat. Smart thermostats can be controlled through your cell phone, your laptop, or even your tablet. Energy Star estimates that by programming your smart thermostat, you'll actually save about $180 a year in energy costs. That's somewhere between $10 and $15 a month. Experts recommend you're setting the thermostat at 78 degrees in the summer and 68 in the winter time. When you're looking to purchase one of these, check with your utility company and see if they offer a rebate on that item. And we would love to know in the comments section, Larry just said it, he said experts recommend 78 degrees on the AC in the summer and 68 degrees uh, when you're using the furnace in the winter, we'd love to know. Tell us in the comments section, what do you keep your thermostat set at? We're going to be honest, ours is set at 75. Turn the AC up or off when you're not at home. This is highly debated and we know it. So many people believe that the best thing you can do for your thermostat is set it at one temperature year round, leave it alone and that's how you're going to save money. However, statistically, that is not the truth. Statistically, by actually allowing the thermostat to be several degrees higher in the summer when you're not home or even turning it off when you're not home will save you money. Here's what happens scientifically. When you turn that thermostat up a few degrees or turn it off, your home will begin to heat up. But once it reaches a certain threshold, it will heat up more slowly every hour thereafter. So consequently, your home actually heats up less in those few hours you're gone from home than you think it will. Here's the other thing you should avoid doing, walking in the door, and turning that thermostat way down to like 68 degrees or something to super cool that house. It may super cool it, but it doesn't do it any more quickly than if you'd set the thermostat right where you wanted it to be in the first place. It will only cool your home off so quickly and lowering the thermostat really low is not gonna help it do that 
any faster than it would if you just set it at 75 degrees, if that's where you want it set. Yeah, because you might forget that you've done that and then you'll end up with icicles hanging from your ceiling. Now, remember too, that if you have a smart thermostat, you can just program the thermostat to go ahead and bring it, bring that temperature down to where you want it 45 minutes or an hour before you come back home. And you'll never know that the thermostat was up several degrees or off when you were gone in the first place. Sign up for an online account with your utility company. This can help you monitor exactly what your usage is on a monthly, even a weekly basis. We're able to see directly into our specific account on our utility company website. If I make some changes and I think we're just gonna try these strategies, we're gonna see if this makes a difference in how much energy we're using every day. Within a few days, I can go on to that utility company website, check my specific account, and I can look and see physically the usage from one day to the next. Not only that, I can do it from one hour to the next hour and on any specific day down to 15 minute increments. This is vital if you are trying to lower your energy usage to be able to instantly know, is what I'm doing helping or is it not helping? Another advantage to signing up for an online account with your utility company is that oftentimes they'll give you really good tips on how to save energy. You can set a daily energy usage threshold. If you go over that threshold, they're gonna shoot you an email and say, by the way, you just went past your threshold. So you'll know instantly, oh, I wanna to try to do some things to cut back on the energy that I'm using. And then finally, a weekly cost analysis can be done by your utility company and they can actually project ahead of time what your costs are going to be for the next week. This will help you make some adjustments on how you want to use that energy in your home to save a little more money. A real life example of how this works in our life, in the middle of winter, they sent us a cost summary and said basically, if you stay on using the same amount of energy you have been, we project your bill will be, it was like $239 or something. And I said, wow, that's kind of pricey, Larry. <laughs> and so we made some very strategic moves uh, between then and the end of the billing cycle. And our final bill was under $200. But had we not received that cost summary and the projected bill amount, we would never have known, wait a minute, we need to be a little more careful. Be sure that your attic is properly insulated. And we would recommend having a professional go through and install that insulation. They can check for areas that there might be some leakage and they may do some extra work, maybe in the corners mm -hmm. or, or down along the ceiling level. That's what they did. We had professional do it in okay. our home. They did things I never would have thought of. In fact, I did the insulation at our older home and I'm sure it was not nearly as good as the job that they did on ours. They'll also know what the correct R factor will be for the design of your home. So have your attic insulated well, that will save you a lot of energy. Use cooking methods that will help you avoid heating up the house. We've talked about this a lot on the channel. Here are some ideas that you may not think of. Grab your toaster oven, take it outside on the front porch. If you have a front porch, if you've got power to that front porch, it's really easy just to plug in that toaster oven and cook something outside. I often do this with crock pots. It's gonna be plugged in six, eight hours. And you don't think of that as actually allowing some heat to build up in your kitchen, but it actually does. Heat comes off of that of every appliance that you plug in. And if you can take that outdoors instead of having it indoors, and it will help so you're not working against actually keeping the inside of your house as cool as possible. Use the sun. You know, we've got a great natural resource. Right now, as we're doing this video, we hung clothes out on the line, and I have my Opus power station charging with the sun. I've got four solar panels and we're going to use that power station to charge the bike, run a coffee maker, and do some other things to save money. We use them even if we're not out of power, but utilize that sun. Another way that we utilize the sun is that we have a homemade solar 
cooker, which we have actually mentioned in previous programs. We can use that to cook outside and use the sun because we think of the sun right now as being our nemesis, right? Well, just sort of turn that around its head and make the sun your friend, but then use the sun <laughs> to do things that you need to get done. Close off vents in areas of the home where you don't need it to be cooled. If you've got a room that's maybe a mm -hmm. spare bedroom, just shut that vent down. You don't need to be cooling it. Make sure that you've got drafts covered under your door. You can get these draft dodgers. It's just a, a long cloth piece of material that fits up against the door and causes air to not flow mm -hmm. through. So you, if you've got a room that's closed off, you want to make mm -hmm. sure that you're not leaking air underneath of that door. Use off-peak electric hours if you have them. Some electric companies actually discount rates overnight or they discount rates on certain days of the week. It pays, literally, to contact your utility company and ask, do you offer any off-peak hours? Maintain your AC. Make sure you have a professional check it out. Make sure that it's not leaking or that it has plenty of coolant in it so it's cooling efficiently. Also, you want to check your filter on your furnace. Make sure that's clean so it's getting good airflow. You also want to check if you have an outside air compressor unit mm -hmm. on a whole house unit. Make sure there's a, there's no weeds on it that's causing a blockage of airflow. A couple of times a year, you just need to put a gentle stream of water through there and clean out all the dirt and debris. Be sure you turn on bathroom exhaust fans when you're taking a bath or you're showering. The whole name of the game is to keep the humidity level down in the house. This next tip is one of Larry's favorites. You know, years ago, and I think it's been about 15 years ago, we bought a kilowatt meter. We first borrowed this device from the library. We wanted to see what our appliances were using. And once you find out how much an appliance is using, then you can start controlling what you do with it. So all you do with this is you plug the appliance in here, plug this into your wall, press the watt button, and it will tell you exactly how much power the device you have plugged into it is consuming. This will help you determine how much you want to use that. And you might want to say, well, maybe we better get something more efficient than what we're doing. I plugged the fan behind me into this unit just a few minutes ago to determine how much wattage it was using. Typically, a fan like this 12-inch one here on high speed uses around 45 watts. And that's what I found out. So by using this, you'll get a handle on how much power you're consuming in your home. That kilowatt meter will also help you with something else very important if you're looking to lower your electric usage. And that is you'll know exactly what you need to unplug. We just heard from a viewer that said, I did what you told me to do. I found out what the energy suckers were in my house. The, the things that when they're plugged in, they're consuming a lot of energy. I started unplugging them. My electric usage dropped in half. That's how powerful this is is. It's called phantom or vampire energy. Mm -hmm. If something has a standing clock on it, if it has standby power where it's just waiting for you to turn it on, then it is going to use energy even if it appears that it's off. For instance, Larry mentioned the microwave. Our microwave uses power even when it's not in use. When it's just plugged in, it's actually using some energy energy. Now, although estimates vary, vampire energy can account for between 10 and 20 percent of your electric usage every single month. Anything that uses a remote control is using phantom power because it has to have power to your, mm -hmm. your unit in order for this to activate it. So this is something to consider. This next set of tips may at first seem to have nothing to do with electric usage, but stick with us because it actually does. We're going to give you a series of tips on how to change the way that you are using your hot water heater. This is especially important if you have an electric hot water heater. We have a gas hot water heater and it uses energy. So one of the things you can do is turn that thermostat on the hot water heater down to where you just want it good and warm but not not blazingly hot. That will save a lot of energy. So you want to make sure you turn that down because that actually does, I think, save about 8% on your energy bill just like that every year by turning it down 20 degrees. You also want to make sure that you're taking shorter showers. I try to get in and out in five minutes. 
You can also get an insulator to put around your hot water heater. They call it a hot water heater blanket. And that will help keep that warmth in and it doesn't mm -hmm. take as much to warm up that water. The burner is not going to be running quite as often if you keep that well insulated. You can also wrap those water pipes in insulation. That will help as well. Wash all your laundry in cold water. We did a whole video about this where I showed you how to save up to $300 a year just by making three or four simple changes to the way that you are doing laundry. I'll make sure that that video is linked up above and in the description of the video. Hey, you know what I did today? I actually used all of the water that I've been dumping into the washing machine from our dehumidifier to wash my clothes. So there's lots of different ways you can think about using water. Also, when I'm bringing hot water into the kitchen to wash dishes, I'll go ahead and fill up the coffee carafe and put that into the coffee maker for the next day. So I've captured that water instead of just letting it run down the drain. Needless to say, don't let the water just flow while you are brushing your teeth. Turn it off in between when you start brushing your teeth and then when you're ready to rinse. You know, you can use as much as two gallons while you're brushing your teeth and that water is just running down the drain. Another thing you can do to save a little bit of water, mm -hmm. if you have one of the larger, older kind of toilets, put a brick in that tank mm -hmm. so that it's not using quite as much water. Now, ours is very efficient. We have smaller tanks, so we don't want to put a brick in ours. It needs all the water it has. Yes. Low flow shower heads and faucet aerators also are two great ways to save not only on your water bill, because remember, mm -hmm. this is like double dipping, right? Because you're saving on your water bill and you're also saving on your energy bill at the same time. Not only is our utility company telling us to prepare to pay $610 more on average per year for energy costs, but they're also telling us that there are strains on the grid this summer and we can expect some rolling blackouts. Now, in case you feel like you need some help prepping and getting ready for a possible blackout situation this summer, we did a whole video on it and showed you exactly how we have prepared for the possibility of rolling blackouts. That video is right over there. You'll want to make sure that you watch that next. Thanks one more time to Creekmore Wealth Advisors for sponsoring the video.